My dear friends, you may be seated as we hear from the New Testament book of Acts today, the 17th chapter. Paul and Silas journeyed through Amphilius and Apollonia, and then they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was Paul's custom, he entered the synagogue and for three Sabbaths interacted with them on the basis of the scriptures. Through his interpretation of the scriptures, he demonstrated that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. And he declared, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. Some were convinced and they joined Paul and Silas, including a larger number of Greek God worshipers and quite a few prominent women. But the Jews became jealous and brought along some thugs who were hanging out in the marketplace, and they formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They attacked Jason's house, intending to bring Paul and Silas before the people. And when they didn't find them, they dragged Jason and some believers before the city officials. They were shouting, these people who have been disturbing the peace throughout the empire have also come here. What is more, Jason has welcomed them into his home, and every one of them does what is contrary to Caesar's decrees by naming someone else as king, Jesus. This provoked the choir, crowd and the city officials even more, and Jason and the others posted bail and released them. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, my friends, as I mentioned earlier, today is World Communion Sunday. And as we celebrate the diversity with Christian brothers and sisters around the world, I hope you've taken notice of the beautiful arrangement all around me today. The area around the altar here today features copper urns from Egypt and Pakistan, textiles from Morocco and baskets from various countries in South America. And we hope that as you come forward to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion today, this setting will help you feel the cultural richness from places afar from us. These items were graciously donated and supplied by Jean Keynes, one of our dear members. Items that she collected along with her late husband during all their travels around the world. These items today remind us that while inside these walls we sing and we will lift up the chalice and the paten. We will drink from the cup and we will eat the bread which Christ has broken in remembrance of Christ's life, his death, and his resurrection and how he called us together to be a community. That as we do these things within these walls, there are tens of millions of brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ who are doing the very same thing. Some of these people will be in churches very much like this sanctuary, but others will be in modest grass huts with dirt floors. Some of them will be in places that have great cathedrals, and paid musicians, while others will be gathered around small tables with chickens clucking all around them and the smell of goats drifting in as they sing from their hearts. I am reminded that amid all of these differences, we are called to be the one body of Christ gathered around, called together, 
because God so loved the world, the world, that he calls us to be united in Christ. And yet, even as we gather around this holy meal, we realize there are differences. Some will call this meal the Eucharist. Some will call it communion. Some will call it the Last Supper. And we will have different understandings of what happens in this meal. Some will believe that as they take the bread and the wine, that they literally become the body and blood of Christ. Others will believe that Christ meets us here in some mysterious way, that the presence of Christ is real in some way that we cannot explain. And others will view this meal as simply a memorial, a remembrance of the last meal that Jesus had with his disciples. And I am sadly reminded that even though all of us agree that this meal is important, some will assert that their understanding of this meal is the only right understanding of this meal. And the divisions between us will be ones that they want to argue about and split us and divide us as a people instead of uniting us. As my heart breaks over that reality, I started to wonder, how do we resolve these differences? How do we become the people that Jesus prayed we would be, that we all might be one even as he and the Father are one? In the passage of scripture that I just read for us today, the Apostle Paul and Silas are going from town to town and they are preaching the gospel of Jesus. And they go into a Jewish synagogue as was his custom. And they preach and they share the good news of God's love for all people. And the passage says that some of the Jews believed Paul and Silas and also some of the Greek God-fearing people and also some of the prominent women. Now we may not realize this, but that was unheard of in Paul's day. To have Greeks and Jews and prominent women all gathered together for the same purpose all gathered together in one place. And the passage says that Paul and Silence had been, become known as people who turned the world upside down. But as I read that passage, I thought maybe what they were really doing was turning the world right side up the way that God has always intended for the world to be, for us to be truly in communion with one another, for us to be a community of love and grace with one another. And I wondered, how was Paul and Silas, how were they able to do this, to help the people who were so different and had different views of things come together and unite together in ways that transformed the world, in ways that through the centuries made it possible for people like you and me to gather in community with one another. I was reminded of an old Aesop fable, a fable that maybe some of you recall it's about a contest between the north wind and the sun. The north wind and the sun were having an argument about which one of them was the most powerful. And as they were arguing, they noticed a man on earth who was sitting with a coat, clutching the lapels of his coat, 
and the north wind and the sun decided, ah, this is how we'll determine which one of us is the most powerful. We'll see which one of us can get that man to take his coat off the fastest. And so the north wind went first, and the north wind blew and blustered hard and mighty. But with each huff and puff, the man just clutched his coat closer and wrapped it around tighter to his body. Finally, the north wind gave up, and he looked at the sun and said, I've done my best huffing and puffing, but the guy will not take off his coat. I bet you can't get him to take it off either. So the sun stood above the man and slowly and gradually just became warmer and warmer degree by degree and finally the man took his coat off the north wind looked at the sun and said how on earth did you get him to do that and the sun said oh it was easy with patience and gentleness with patience and gentleness, I was able to get my way. My friends, I believe that's exactly what Paul and Silas did. They didn't go in to that synagogue telling the Jews, you are wrong, you need to follow us. They didn't call them names. They simply, with grace, shared the story of God's love through Jesus Christ and how their lives had been transformed, how they had been blessed with a change. You see, Paul himself knew something about power and where real power comes from. If you remember Paul's life, Paul started out as someone who wanted to persecute the Christians. He believed so much that he was right and that the Christians were wrong that he went about trying to annihilate all of the Christians. And that was until he met Jesus Christ. And the love and the grace of Christ changed his heart. And he began to reach out in grace and love to help transform others. In his letter to the church in Colossae, he said, The same good news that I have received is changing lives all over the world. That same good news of the grace of Jesus Christ. We have just finished a sermon series talking about the church that the world needs. And we've said that the church needs to be brave and courageous. The church needs to be curious. The church needs to be one that is willing to take risk. But my friends, today as we begin our stewardship series looking at blessings, I believe this is the key to being the church the world needs being brave, courageous, and curious begins with our ability to share our blessings of grace with the world. For that is truly what will change the world when people understand the grace and the love of God for each and every one of us and how that grace has been a blessing in our lives and transformed and changed our lives. You see, being a steward is really about managing all that God has given to us. And one of the greatest things that God has given to each one of us is the ability to influence others. The ability to make a difference in this world by the way we act and the words we say and the things we do. By our demeanor and our response to others in this world. God's way of grace can touch the world as we are willing to release that gift of grace upon others in the world. My friends, 
you may not think you have many blessings in this world, but I want us throughout this series to look at the ways that God has blessed us with deep and powerful gifts. The gift of breath, the gift of time, the gift of talents, the gift of physical resources and mental abilities, the gift of speech, the gift of communication, the gift of writing, the gift of sharing our heart with others. Through all of these ways, we can impart grace upon others and truly change the world. You know, the mission of the United Methodist Church and of this congregation is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And sometimes I think we don't really believe that we can transform the world. We don't take that mission seriously enough. But I want to leave you with this thought that one of the greatest gifts that God has given to any of us, one of the greatest blessings that has been bestowed upon us is our ability to influence others, to bless others the way we have been blessed with love and forgiveness, with believing in themselves and eyes to see the world the way God intends it to be. The great preacher Fred Craddock tells a story that imparts to me how powerful our influence can be. Fred Craddock says that his father never believed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. His father was one of those who did not want to hear the story. He did not want to go to church. In fact, he was anti-church and antagonistic against the church. But Fred's mother always took Fred and his brother to church on Sundays. They lived in East Tennessee, and East Tennessee was right smack in the middle of the Bible Belt, where Fred Craddock's father's anti-church sentiments and attitudes did not sit well with the people. But Fred's mother was faithful, and with gentleness, every Sunday morning, she would take her children to church. Once a year, every year, Fred said, his church would have revival services. Anybody heard of revival services? We don't do them much anymore. And they would invite someone they called an evangelist to come. And that person would preach fire and brimstone to the people. And every year, the preacher would take the evangelist around the community to visit the homes of people who did not go to church. So every year, the evangelist and the preacher would show up at Fred Craddock's house, and the evangelist and preacher would sit down in the living room across from Fred's father, and Fred said it felt to him like the preacher was saying to the evangelist, he's the one you need to preach to right now, so give him all you got. And the evangelist would be like a pit bulldog and just attack the father, bluster and blowing and huffing and puffing. And after a while, his father would have enough of it, and his father would say, okay, I've heard enough of your story. I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't believe any of it. Get out of my house. And all the while, Fred and his mother and brother would be in the kitchen listening to all of that, and Fred would notice his mother quietly crying as her tears dropped into the sudsy water in the sink. Well, many years later, Fred went off to seminary, and Fred became a professor of New Testament. He moved away from Tennessee 
He was busy teaching. One day, he got a phone call saying that his father was deathly ill and didn't have much longer to live. If he wanted to have some last words with his father, he needed to come on home. So Fred made the trip back to East Tennessee, and he went into the hospital room where his father had that oxygen mask on, and his father was sound asleep. Fred noticed in the room there were lots of beautiful floral arrangements and balloons and a stack of cards that high. So while his father was sleeping, Fred decided he would look through those cards. And every one of those cards was from someone in that little church. And those cards said things like, we're praying for you. We love you. You mean a lot to us. While Fred was reading those cards, his father woke up. His father motioned for Fred to come by the bedside, and he grabbed a pad that was laying there by the bed, and he wrote upon it. He wrote upon it these words. Tell them my story. Fred looked at his dad and he shook his head and he goes, well, What's your story, Dad? What is it you want me to tell them? And his father took the pad back again and he wrote the words, Tell them I was wrong. It was the gentle graceful, patient love of that community. The gentle, patient, grace-filled love of his wife and his children that helped to transform his heart and help him to believe that God loved him, that that blessing was his as well. My friends, that's the power we have as a community of faith. Every time we open these doors to an unbelieving world, we have the power to reach out with grace and love. We don't have to scream and bluster. We need to love with grace and to bless others in the ways that we have been blessed. And that really and truly, when you think about it, is what this meal before us is all about. This meal is a meal of love and grace, of gentleness, of God reaching out to us and saying, I love you so much that I am willing to give my life for each one of you. It is a meal that reminds me that if Jesus had to do it all over again, he would do it all over again because he wants to bless us and call us together as a community of faith. As we prepare our hearts and minds to receive this meal today, I hope that as you come forward with your hands open to receive this gift, that you will remember that it is a gift of blessing and grace, a gift that has the power to transform our hearts and our lives as we receive the gift of forgiveness and the power to go forth and be vessels of love in this community. As we come forward to receive this gift, let us pray for our siblings around the globe who are dealing with difficulties in this world and let us pray for wisdom and insight on the ways that we can use our blessings to bless them and encourage them on their faith journey. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.